General Medicaid warning. The views expressed in Five Ish Minute Lore, The Lore Delivered in Rants, are sanctioned by their scholar progenium as excess rages. Prolonged exposure can result in loss of IQ, high blood pressure, random outbursts, and blunt force trauma to the skull, resulting in unconsciousness. Please consult your local physician for more information. When Pollux first met Dantioch, they spoke over the connection made by the Ferris between the worlds of Sotha and McCrag, inside of a chapel where Dantioch had fully stabilized the signal. Naturally, there was some friction, mainly because Pollux wasn't convinced in the slightest that Dantioch was on the up and up, and rightfully who could blame him. Pollux was jaded towards the Iron Warriors to the point of outright telling Dantioch he wasn't quite done murdering members of the Fourth yet. Dantioch pointed out that his kinsmen weren't quite done killing members of the Fist yet either. Pollux and Dantioch were not starting off well, until Barbarous Dantioch brought them together over a mutual love, that of sieging and fortifying. <laughs> as well as the fact that they get to pull their knowledge, with Dantioch teaching Pollux everything that he knew, secrets only known to the Iron Warriors. All in the name of fortifying McCrag, or in other words, upping the Ultramarines. A budding bromance formed between the two, where basically they began to shit all over the Ultramarines and teaching them how to fortify their own home system. Basically, it got deep between the two. Bonding over talks about Rock Creek and talking about sieging and fortifying. Dantuck was also attracting more tourists to McCrag, namely Lionel Johnson and most of his legion. Unfortunately for literally everyone involved, Lionel Johnson brought along someone else. We've been trying to reach you about your car's extended warranty. It's a well-established social fact that when you're visiting the house of a relative or a friend, it's expected that certain protocols be observed. Don't track mud on the carpet. Put your glass in the sink. Shit like that. You can bring a pet, but if you do, it has to be at the homeowner's express consent, and it has to be house trained. You can't just walk in after diving in a lake of sewage with a rabid pit bull that you've been feeding a steady diet of meth, toddlers, and steroids to on no leash. Now, Lionel Johnson is not exactly the most socially adept individual, but those rules are universal and clear. Lionel Johnson actually did worse than that. Lionel Johnson brought Conrad fucking curs. And the lion didn't tell Gilliman. For those of you who don't know who dear old Conrad Curse is, let me enlighten you. Conrad Curse is the Primarch of the Night Lords, who specializes in terror tactics and generally horrific shit. In a universe filled to the brim with horrifically fucked up people, they rank in second place as a group only coming in behind the Drakari, who have spent millions of years being assholes. But while the Drakari do what they do because they feel like it's the only way to survive, the Night Lords do what they do for the fucking lols. And Conrad Curse is their Primark. Conrad Curse decided that McCrag was boring, and he was gonna spice it up in only ways that he knew how. The first thing he did was hack the flagship of the Dark Angels and order a mass drop pod assault on the capital of McCrag, which, if you're not paying attention to when this was happening, caused quite the bit of divide between Gilliman and the Lion, to the point where the Lion was basically begging Gilliman not to blow all of his space marines into blood mist in the atmosphere. If Gilliman hadn't told the planetary defense guns on McCrag to stand down, the Lion would have lost about 400 drop pods full of Dark Angels in that very moment. But Conrad Kurz is the Billy Mays of the 40k heresy days, so he was here to show them all the ways in which Mighty Putty, aka plastic explosives, Oxyclean, aka bleach for the shit in everyone's pants, and the Crocodile Cutter, aka his power claws, could make their lives different in a matter of hours, aka he was there to put on a demonstration. Hey kids, wanna see a dead body? In short, he had the Ultramarines ultra pissing themselves. Gilliman came within a mouse hairs away from punching the lion in the face, which would have gone hilariously bad for Gilliman. And Conrad Kerr showed a bunch of Ultramarines what the phrase shitting bricks means. He was showing up slaughtering squads of Ultramarines and Dark Angels, and then leaving some alive and mining their bodies just to give the rescuer a great surprise. He set up tripwires that had mines, and tripwires that were just wires just to fuck with them before he'd come out of a shadow and kill them. The Ultramarines were panicking so hard over what Conrad 
Conrad Curse was doing that a command to kill all shadows was given. He planted these delightful seeds in the garden, those seeds being grenades, for that burst of aroma, and half the Ultramarines were convinced there were more than just one of him. This all happened to be going on when Alexis Pollux and Barbaros Dantioch were in their nightly session of You hang up! No, you hang up! Conrad Curse burst into the room where Pollux and Dantioch were FaceTiming. That's when Dantioch found an entire new use for the Pharos, keeping his best bro from getting brutally murdered in front of his face. Dantioch could actually sense where Conrad Curse was, and when and from what direction Curse was going to attack from, which was the only thing that kept Pollux alive for more than three seconds. Dantioch could actually predict the strikes of Curse through the Pharos, and Pollux was actually doing well. Take note, the power of the bromance between them had escalated to the point where Pollux was deflecting shots from Conrad Curse, a Primarch on my list of top five best melee fighters of all time. Until he wasn't. Conrad Curse prepared to kill Pollux, only stopping when he realized that he was stabbing Pollux, but Pollux wasn't dying. Why can't you just Dantioch had just found another use for the Pharos accidentally. When his bromance was about to be ended by three long blades through the chest, Dantioch reached out and grabbed Pollux by the hand and literally yeeted him from the crag to Sotha. A few minutes later, while Gilliman and the Lion were trying to figure out exactly how that happened, Conrad Curse pulled a Billy Mays. Am I smashing my hand with this hammer to show you the amazing protection you get from Impact Gel? And this hammer is real. And started putting a beat down on both Primarchs. Then he literally took a bow and blew up the entire building. While he had been fighting them, Conrad Curse had planted explosives throughout the entire chapel. So let's keep it all in track. Conrad Curse by himself almost caused the death of well over 4800 Dark Angels in a failed drop pot assault on McCrack Civitas, terrorized the entire planet, killed a good handful of captains and other officers of both the Ultramarines and the Dark Angels. He made the Courage and Honor crew start screaming because they saw the shadows smiling at them and he would have killed or at the very least severely wounded both Gilliman and Lionel Johnson and he did it all by himself. Dantioch and Pollux had reached through the Pharaoh's connection that Sotha had with McCrag and yeeted both Primarchs to the planet of the Sotha at the last moment before the building collapsed with the power of bromance. When Gilliman figured out how to use the Pharaohs to get back to McCrag and took the lion with him, Pollux decided he would stay with Dantioch so they could explore how the Pharos worked. Together. The bromance deepened between the two, to the point where even the faintest hint of animosity between the Iron Warriors and the Fist had completely vanished. Conrad Curse continued with his Billy Mays impression on McCrag. But, everything was going swimmingly on Sotha. And then, on the wind, another voice was heard. Are you following me, camera guy? Conrad Curse's kids had found Sotha and decided to show up. The first thing they did was take over Destroyer and torture every survivor to death. The second thing they did was take over a space station and torture everybody to death. The third thing they did was assault the Pharaohs itself at seven companies strong. The Night Lords might have done alright if they were assaulting something defended by, I don't know, Blood Angels or maybe Salamanders, but they were directly assaulting a position held by Dantioch and commanded by Pollux himself. The Night Lords were getting wrecked worse than a demolition derby. They couldn't assault by air because the Pharaohs had so much air defense it was literally impossible. The Pharaohs itself provided too much interference to teleport in. While the Night Lords were trying to figure out what to do, they figured they needed some entertainment. So they took the capital of the city and cut loose on the inhabitants, and yes, it was about as horrifying as it sounds. Remember, kids, good times rhymes with war crimes. It didn't help them plan anything, but they did it to be dicks, so there you go. Eventually, one of the Night Lords cut a deal with a demon. The demon would get to possess him, and they would get a teleportation lock inside the Pharaohs. The Night Lord Terminator Claw teleported inside while the rest of the Night Lords attacked from outside, overwhelming the defenders and taking both Pollux and Dantioch hostage. The fleet headed through the war to save them, saw the Pharaohs itself go completely dark. 
Dantioch was taken and tortured for a ridiculous amount of time, but he didn't break. He was dragged back to the operating room of the Pharos and beaten again. The leader of the Night Lords started torturing and killing Ultramarines in front of Dantioch to get him to reveal how to use the Pharos. Dantioch refused to do anything for them until the Night Lords revealed to him that they had captured Pollux. Threats of violence and actual violence did nothing to Dantioch himself, but when they put Pollux on a cross and, by the throne that sounds Laneshi, put pain spikes in his interface ports, he finally caved. Dantioch did his best to keep Pollux from being tortured, caving in again and again to the Night Lord's demand, but he was beyond pissed off. When the Night Lords almost ripped out Pollux's tongue to get Dantioch to obey, Dantioch was 110% done with them. When the Night Lords tried to use the Pharaohs to reconnect their legion together, Dantioch took his shot. The Night Lords wanted to be sent to their flagship, and Dantioch, well, he was more than happy to send them there. Dantioch might have been so physically old he couldn't move fast, or bend over, or even shit properly after his running with the Herod that I talked about in part one of this, but he was very adept at using every tool in his disposal to make traitors pass tense. He used the only tool at his disposal right now, the Pharos itself, overloading it with not only the power that was generated by his own machinery, but by his absolute hatred of the Night Lords for daring to hurt Pollux. He channeled the energy of the Pharos into his own body, throwing the Night Lords to the flagship of their fleet, kicking and screaming and in pieces. And with a final roar of pure hatred, Dantioch blasted the last of them away. And with it, the Pharos itself. A massive psychic explosion ripped out from the Pharos, the entire mountain complex shaking. Dantioch himself was thrown to the ground, his armor smoking, and as his head hit the ground, the Iron Mask of the Fourth was knocked off his face, revealing his features for the first time in decades. When the Night Lords went through the portal that Dantioch created, they all died. Well, most of them. The ones that had names survived, plot armor and all that, but hey, they were back on board with their legion on the flagship at least, only to have that same legion turn on them. Night Lords. Back on Sotha, Pollux struggled to get to his feet, cradling the warsmith in his arms. Barbarous Dantioch was dying, and Alexis was trying not to cry as his friend spoke to him one last time. Alexis told Dantioch that Dantioch was his friend and his teacher. Alexis held Dantioch tight, as if he could keep the life of the warsmith in him by pure will alone. Pollux wanted to be able to give Dantioch water, something, anything to help his friend. As they clutched onto each other, Dantioch told Pollux that he was glad to have known him. Dantioch, with his final breath, said the following, I am glad, Alexis. I am glad to have been. I am glad to have known you. It is something that friendship can exist at all in this universe of terror and betrayal. I have no strength left. I have done my duty and I'm no longer ashamed. All hail the Emperor of Mankind, still beloved by all. May his dream be saved, even if we cannot. And then, held in the arms of a weeping Imperial Fist, Dantioch the Iron Warrior died. Three hours later, when the relief fleet had arrived and sent a force to the Pharos, Dantioch was still there, with Pollux by his side. Pollux refused food. He refused water or medication. He refused all medical attention whatsoever, even though he was heavily wounded. It was only when Gilliman himself commanded him to rise that he did so. But when Gilliman told him that his ultramarines would see to taking care of the warsmith's body, Pollux refused. Pollux refused to allow anyone else to touch the warsmith, his friend. Wounded and barely able to walk, Pollux carried his friend to his final resting place. To chance of hero of the Imperium, Barbarous Dantioch was finally laid to rest. What happened to Dantioch's loyalist iron warriors isn't clear. When Dantioch was assigned to the Pharaohs, all mention of them goes away. There's one possibility, that being the Silver Skull Space Marine chapter, a chapter who in the current age of the Imperium does not know who their Primarch is. There are several hints to this, including the chapter's motto, which closely matches with a quote from Dantioch. 
show me a fortress, and I'll show you a ruin. Alexis Pollux would go on to fight in the final battle of the Horus Heresy, and when the second founding of the Space Marines occurred, he was selected to be the leader of one of the first two successor chapters of the Imperial Fists. Sigismund was of course given the Black Templars, and Pollux himself led the Crimson Fists. For 800 years, he continued to serve the Imperium before falling in battle for a system codified as HR-8518 against the Scythians. He never forgot his friend Dantioch. Not until his dying day. What does the story of two people who by all rights should have hated each other tell us? What can we learn from this beautiful story of friendship and comradeship? By following the lessons taught by Alexis Pollux of the Imperial Fists and Barbarus Dantioch of the Iron Warriors, what do we gain? What do we get? WE GET FUCKING TYRANNIDS! <laughs> yeah! Remember that psychic shockwave I told you about? A massive psychic explosion ripped out from the Pharos, the entire mountain complex shaking. That's what attracted them to the galaxy in the first damn place! Oh, old man, don't be so hard on me, it's such a beautiful story of friends- SHUT UP! They just had to be friends and bond, yet close talking about sieging, and fortifying, and feeling their emotions with a mountain-sized Xeno device. And look where the hell that got us! Because of these two assholes not doing what they should have done, and embracing the hate, now we have to deal with a little tide of these little claw shitters! How dare they get along! An Imperial Fist getting along with an Iron Warrior? See, this is what happens! This shit right here! This is why I'll never say a nice thing about the towel except they go well with brown gravy and mashed potatoes. Medium rare! Ball burn! Crippman popped a sector! Trillions are dead! And the towel still exists! Because of their stupid little friendship when the towel were being exterminated during the Damocles Gulf Crusade, the flea had to turn around to deal with what? Tyranids! That's right! Fuck you, Alexis Pollux! Fuck you, Barbarus Dantioch! Fucking towel! Captain, we have an all clear from the Commissar to... Captain? Ugh. First officer, the Commissar has concluded his Voxcast. Also, he's put in a request for a longer broadcast window in the near future. He says it's for... M-O-T-E-6? Well... It's about time.